911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? 911, what is the address of your emergency? 911, what is the address of your emergency? And what's going on today? Uh, we have one, we have a, a friend who is unconscious. He hasn't moved. He's, he's cold extremity. He's probably in an ambulance. Okay. Shocking information that two other roommates were inside the house when the four students were slaughtered. Published reports identified the roommates as Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, both 21. Have they lawyered up? Are they concerned about being questioned? Have, are they cooperating? It's my understanding that they're fully cooperative with investigators. A surviving roommate in the University of Idaho quadruple murders is fighting a court order to appear at accused murderer Brian Koberger's preliminary hearing set for June. In late December, Koberger was arrested for the murders of four students who were found stabbed to death in their off-campus home in November of last year. He was extradited from his parents' home in Pennsylvania to Moscow, Idaho. Since then, he's been held at the Latah County Jail. Court documents from March 24th show a magistrate judge ruled Bethany Funk must attend Koberger's upcoming preliminary hearing. At the time of the murders, Funk was in her bedroom on the first floor of the home on King Road. The out court documents on March 24th, asking the court to, quote, assist in securing the attendance of Bethany Funk as a witness on behalf of the defendant in this case. In support of this, a criminal investigator hired by the defense team reported facts about the case, pointing out that Funk's bedroom was on the first floor of the home, that she was interviewed by police on multiple occasions, and she was at the home when 911 was called, as well as when investigators arrived on the scene to discover the homicide. Bethany Funk was one of the survivors, and now she's agreeing to be interviewed by the defense in the murder case. Attorneys for the suspect Brian Koberger issuing a subpoena for Funk to testify. Koberger's legal team claiming Funk has exculpatory information that might help to exonerate him. An investigator for the defense writing, Ms. Funk's information is unique to her experiences and cannot be provided by another witness. Funk's attorney fought back filing a motion to quash the duration of Koberger's trial. One reason the defense may want to call this witness is they have some reason to believe that she'll testify inconsistently with what she's told police in the past. If that were to happen while she's under oath, that would be a really big benefit to the defense because now they'll have something to cross-examine her with at trial. Throughout the document, Funk's last name is spelled F-U-N-K, missing the E. Funk's legal representation points this out in court documents filed on April 21st, noting Funk's name is, quote, repeatedly misspelled throughout the defense's filing. Funk's team argues these claims lack support, saying the subpoena was issued by a clerk of court without a hearing, meaning Funk didn't have a chance to address her concerns. They also point out Funk is now out of state living in Nevada. Her attorneys filed a motion for the court to quash the subpoena that would require her to attend the hearing. And now she's agreeing to be interviewed by the defense in the murder case. Are you waiving your right to a speedy preliminary hearing and agreeing that that hearing can be held outside the 14-day period? Yes. A grand jury indicts Brian Koberger in the murders of four University of Idaho students, taking his case to a higher court and the next phase. I'm Anjanette Levy, and thanks for joining us here on Law & Crime. A Lataw County grand jury has indicted Brian Koberger in the murders of Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, 
at their home off campus in November of 2022. The four were stabbed to death in an off-campus home, some as they slept. Cronodal's father told a news outlet in Arizona that she had defensive wounds after fighting her attacker. A former defense attorney of Koberger's had told me that he hopes to be exonerated. The former Washington State University PhD student was supposed to be in court in Moscow on June 26th for a week-long preliminary hearing. That would have given his attorneys an opportunity to challenge the evidence in the case, specifically DNA evidence police claim links him to the crime. Going to a grand jury means that hearing won't happen, since a grand jury has determined there is probable cause that Koberger committed the crimes. The preliminary hearing would have likely done the same thing. The bar for probable cause is low. Josh Ritter is a defense attorney in California. Josh, what do you make of this move by the prosecution to go to the grand jury to seek an indictment, making the need for a preliminary hearing totally unnecessary? As a former prosecutor, this is no shock to me at all. I, I, I think a lot of people saw this one coming. In a case of this complexity and of this magnitude, you can't imagine why they would want to put a prelim on. They can do a grand jury almost at their leisure. They can call in witnesses, put it over for a couple of days, call a few more witnesses, as long as that grand jury is still convened. In a preliminary hearing, they have to do it all at once. And the other advantage that the prosecution has is that the defense is not present. Now, that means that the prosecutor wears two hats to some extent and has to present some uh, evidence that's exculpatory, but not to the extent that you would see in a preliminary hearing where each witness would be subject to cross-examination and uh, you know, perhaps even the calling of witnesses on the part of the defense. Josh, this puts the defense at a disadvantage because they would have been permitted to question the state's witnesses and possibly glean information through cross-examination that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do or to get. Yeah, it's hard to not see it any other way. They, they will still get transcripts. They'll still get the testimony of what was taken during the grand jury, but it would not be, as you pointed out, subjected to rigorous cross-examination where they could pin each of the prosecution's witnesses to a particular narrative and hold them to that for when this eventually goes to trial. But now all they're left with is the testimony at the, at the grand jury uh, uh, hearing, which is helpful, but not nearly as helpful as a preliminary hearing would have been for the defense. So what's the next step? These recent deaths at the hands of police have been investigated by grand juries, which typically sit for months in private to hear a variety of cases, deciding whether there's enough evidence to put a suspect on trial. Well, now some people are questioning this process, so we asked Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford to tell us more. The grand juries that decided not to indict officers Wilson and Pantaleo are part of a system enshrined in the Constitution, considered by the framers to be an important check on government power. But now there is growing criticism government prosecutors can hijack the system to get results they want. The Cato Institute's Timothy Lynch co-authored a scathing analysis 11 years ago, a grand facade how the grand jury was captured by government. If they want an indictment, they're going to get an indictment. If they don't want an indictment, it won't happen. A grand jury is significantly different from a regular jury. 